It's just starting field trials now because so many people have made it so bureaucratically impossible to put that stuff in the ground. I do have to say, though, Greenpeace, who I hold in very low historic esteem, um, has recently started to say that maybe under certain circumstances it might be possible to look into the theoretical chance that they should do something with golden rights in certain places. I I've seen them lie down in the roads to keep trucks from going places, so this is a big change and I hope it, I hope it means something more. You know, the truth is, I don't want anyone to misinterpret me. I, don't, I think we live in the best world that there has ever been. But it doesn't mean we live in the best of possible worlds. We don't always have leaders and governments we can trust. Corporations are driven by profit. That's what they do. That's their job. They return money to shareholders. And that often that works well. It's not always a goal that is compatible with our basic drive to improve the lot of humanity. I don't think that is the fault of corporate America or the corporate world. It's our problem as a, as a society to, solve, to, to care about those people. It's not, you know, we don't need Merck to send billions of dollars to Haiti. It would be nice if they did. We, don't, we shouldn't expect that. We should do it. We should all do it because we should care enough to do it. This isn't a corporate matter. It's a matter of our own personal ethics. And so stop putting all this stuff off onto people who make your life better, even if you want to admit it. But we do that for a reason, and I understand the reason. There's been this erosion of um, our faith and leadership. When I was growing up, you know, if a doctor told my mother to go stand on her head for three months because it would cure her headache, she, she'd do it. Probably still would do it. Um, we don't do that anymore, and that's great. Um, I think possibly we used to grow up wanting to be president. God forbid my mother do something like that. Um, we have changed. We don't care as much about listening to authority, and that's a good thing. And there are reasons for that, and I'll say some of them. Vioxx, Watergate, Three Mile Island, DES babies, Chernobyl, the Challenger, the Pinto, weapons of mass destruction. Well, maybe that was partly the press as well. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but there are so many examples of government telling us something that is not true that we've come to be absolutely appropriately suspicious of what they say. But that doesn't mean that we have to give up on science or technology. If you don't like the way a company does something, it's a company. Science isn't a company. Science isn't a country. It's a way of doing something. If people don't like that Monsanto owns too many seeds, too many patents, that's something worth talking about. That's a legislative issue, and we have the power to change that. It has nothing to do with genetic engineering. And people have a hard time listening to those facts. Because when I talk about genetically engineered food, people say, too much pesticide, poisoning the earth, evil Monsanto. Okay, let's put Monsanto aside for a second. The data on pesticide and insecticide use after the introduction of genetically engineered foods is remarkably clear. There's hundreds of millions of gallons less of it used all the time every year. There are thousands of people in India who didn't get poisoned to death in the last couple of years because they weren't having to use the type of pesticides they used to use before there were GE products. That's true in China too. These are inconvenient facts, but they are easily noted facts, and I'll be happy to tell you where to go get them. Um, this, this is why I, I decided to write about this book, because it, as you might sense, drives me a little crazy. But I didn't decide to write an encyclopedia of denialism. And I guess I need to fess up to that because um, some of you may have seen the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and the internet and I aren't getting along this week. Um, <laughs> I skipped over some things and that has been, I've been taken to task for them. And one of them that people are upset about is creationism and another is climate change. And again, this is not an encyclopedia of despair and magical thinking. I don't think I needed to have a chapter asserting that Barack Obama really is an American citizen. I didn't have a chapter that AIDS is caused by HIV. I actually believe both of those things are true. I thought it would be more useful to explore areas like vaccines and food and vitamins and personal genomics where there's a lot of gray. There are, there's reasonable room for doubt and discussion and I'm sorry, I don't see the gray in evolution. 
I don't know what my writing a chapter about that would have added to the discourse. If you believe your ancestors rode around on the backs of dinosaurs, I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> but I will admit this. I did almost write about creationism. I went down to the Creation Museum in Kentucky, which I urge all people to do. And I, it wasn't the intention of writing, but I showed up early on the Saturday morning that it had widely been leaked that Barack Obama was going to choose Hillary Clinton as his Secretary of State. And I was eating in the cafeteria, Noah's Lounge, maybe you've never heard of it. And there was a family at the next table and they were watching this announcement stream off CNN and they were getting so worked up. And they were talking about Rahm Emanuel and Obama. And there was a silence for a minute and then the mother woke up and said, oh my God, this country is going to be run by a black man and a Jew and that horrible woman. <laughs> and then, for reasons I will never understand, she looked at me like I was going to give her a nod of agreement and I went, I gave her two thumbs up. I went to the parking lot, I drove to the airport, and I went home. <laughs> so that's why I stand that creation. So the environment is a different issue. Um, I didn't write about it because I felt that, too, the data is so clear. Uh, I didn't know the climate gate was going to make it so obvious that so many people really don't believe the truth. I still don't think I could have made much of a contribution. Al Gore has done more than I can do. The IPCC. James Hansen, there are millions of people, my colleague at the New Yorker, Betsy Colbert. Um, it just didn't seem like one of those issues that I could move the ball forward on. I did write a chapter about synthetic biology, and one of the reasons for doing that is I wanted to address some of the ways we could get out of the terrible man-made crisis that we ourselves have caused with climate change. Um, I guess that this actually started for me more than 20 years ago, but I didn't know it. I went to a, I kind of had a shouting, I had one shouting match with the person I was writing about in my career. It just happened to be Peter Duesberg. Um, and and I, there are some there are some people from Staten Island who are young. So Peter Duesberg is sort of the intellectual force behind the idea that HIV doesn't cause AIDS. And as such, he is one of the most pernicious and evil men who has ever lived. That's my own personal view, not the view of your sponsors. Um, and so I challenged him at this meeting of the New York Academy of Science. I said, listen, if, if HIV is this harmless passenger virus, why don't you, you have two daughters, just inject them with the shit. I mean, why not? If it's meaningless, why not do that? And he demurred. <laughs> and I may have insisted more than was appropriate. And this went on, and uh, it worked out ugly. So, but fine. Fast forward. Three weeks ago, I was reading from my book in Barnes and Noble in New York City, and the police had to drag a screaming lunatic out of the reading. My daughter came to that. It's really nice. Um, and the reason that she was screaming at me was because she felt that I was one of the arrogant, elitist, pro-government lackeys who blindly supported the idea that AIDS is caused by HIV. And actually, after um, tens of thousands of studies and tens of millions of deaths. I, I am one of them. I'm fine. Um, still, it didn't add up to like a trend of denialism. And then about a decade ago, I did this little piece for the New Yorker on vaccines and crazy lunatics who think vaccines are bad. I thought, ah, they're just crazy lunatics who think vaccines are bad. It's fine. And then I did a story on Monsanto. And that was really something. Because there you get frankenfoods, you get the idea of suicide seeds, which is one of the greatest public relations ideas in the world. The idea that seeds will somehow terminate and break the great chain of nature, and just that some guy in a lab coat in St. Louis is destroying agricultural history. It's a great idea. I mean, it didn't matter that even before they developed the technology, Monsanto pledged never to use it. Those things don't matter. Um, and I wish they would use it, because there are good reasons to use it. Um, but then I got into the vitamins and the potions and the elixirs, and it all sort of clicked for me, and not in a particularly good way. Um, I saw that we've gotten somehow to a point where progress is suspect, where it's often a dirty word, where facts don't seem to matter, where we embrace fear more than we embrace reality. 
And if we don't stop doing this, the